Yep. Great. I see a few people are still joining us, so um, we'll get started and, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a, a full audience soon enough. Uh, welcome to this discussion today. Um, I'm very excited about this discussion and to talk about the BDAM's annual report and to also talk about uh, the state of democracy and to give some examples from IFAS's perspective. I'm joined today by Stefan Lindbergh, who is the director of the Varieties of Democracy Institute, and he's also a political science professor at the University of Gothenburg. Um, Cassie Emmons, who's also a democracy data analyst at, the, uh, at IFAS in the Center of Applied Research and Learning, and Fernanda Burrell, who's a research specialist within the Center for Applied Research and Learning. I think it's um, such an interesting time for the work that we're doing, uh, and also to be thinking about the state of democracy. It's been interesting and, and to watch over the last 10, 20 years and the decline in democracy, which VDEM has clearly um, documented through its data and its research. But I do wonder if the narrative democracy needs to change. I do believe that you know, for so many years now, we've been watching the decline of democracy and we've a little bit been wringing our hands about that when I do think a narrative needs to change and we need to talk about the positive side of democracy to give a different narrative to what the autocrats, kleptocrats have been saying. I wonder if democracy can get its confidence back to try to show that it's, a, that it's a, an ideal form of government. I think when we first started in this business so long ago, we introduced liberal uh, economic policies and democracy and thought that they would just continue on on their own. And I think we've learned that it's a, it's a form of government that we have to fight for. We have to give positive um, stories about what democracy can do to um, combat this, the, the narrative that's been spun about how weak democracy is and how it's not uh, up to the time in which we are uh, living in. It's a very complex and long-term project that we've all been working on. And I, I do hope um, that there is a new sense that the um, community democracies need to work together um, to protect what we hold dear in our form of government. Um, and so I'm very excited to talk about uh, where we stand. I know that I sounded a little bit hopeful, but I think some of the data is probably not going to support my view in some ways, but maybe that's changing. Um, and I, I look forward to hearing the discussion. And with that, I'm going to hand it over first to Stefan, who will discuss uh, their annual report. Um, Stefan? Thank you so much, Shad. And uh, let me say I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and hopefully we'll have time here today to discuss that. Um, <clears throat> I'm tasked here with first talking about uh, the VDEM Institute Democracy Report 2022, autocratization changing nature, question mark. And, and that, I think, speaks to our sense looking at the data and that this year there is uh, something of a qualitative shift or at least moving towards a qualitative shift. And there are several indications of that and I will uh, talk through that. The report has three main parts. I'm going to give the highlights in just 15 minutes here of uh, <clears throat> say each of the, of the three parts. So let's look first. Democracy worldwide. The state uh, in 2021. Um, the first thing is that by our count, we're now back to 1989 levels. Um, and uh, how does the, the evidence look like? Well, it looks like this. So this is the Liberal Democracy Index weighted for population size. Why do we do that? Because democracy is ruled by the people. So it kind of matters how many people are affected by a level of democracy. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, uh, so you can think of it this way, this world average, the black line in the middle with the confidence intervals around it, that's like the level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen. And <clears throat> you see there, if it's been sloping downwards quite dramatically in the last few years, and the same for all the world regions. And in fact, if we then uh, draw that red line as we do in the middle there, um, to see where we were last at this level, it's 1989 or even before that. So that whole expansion, almost explosion of political rights, civil liberties and freedoms that we saw in the world in the wake of the Cold War 
throughout the former Soviet Union, but also Asia and Africa and even in Latin America, then that at a global level has been eradicated. That should put things in perspective, I think. Now, we can also, we also see this, which we think is another sort of indication of this changing nature, that there are really uh, uh, bad dictatorships are on the rise. So here's how the evidence look. The same underlying indicators, just translated then into regime types instead of the liberal democracy index. And going back all the way, way to 71, and we see this, uh, the third wave of democratization, right, and the steep decline in closed dictatorships. And then in the last 10 years, they've been creeping up and then really uh, uh, increasing in numbers now lately, up to 30. And together with electoral autocracies, um, the most common regime type in the world, uh, they now harbor 70% of the world population up from 49% just 10 years ago. Um, that's really, uh, we think, worrying. And at the same time, the number of liberal democracies, the really good democracies in the world, is declining. And this is particularly worrying for the things that we'll hear a little bit more about later with the, the, the work we did in Case for Democracy, because a lot of the benefits, the dividends of democracy, only uh, materializes when democracy reaches highest level and you become a really good democracy. Um, and one of those things is armed conflicts. So this is one area I just wanted to highlight. Um, this wave of autocratization is going to mean more armed conflicts. Um, these, there is so much rigorous research out there now uh, that prove the uh, Immanuel Kant's democratic peace theory. Democracies don't fight with each other, but they're also much less prone to other forms of armed conflict. And the decline of democracy in India over the past six years or so has meant now that the risk with the militarized conflict with Pakistan has increased by 300%. That's not peanuts. And look at this. Here is Russia. So on the horizontal axis there, there's a level of democracy. Uh, and then the pro probability of an armed conflict, that Russia would engage with an armed conflict. And we know what's going on in Europe today. So based on this sort of very rigorous research and just uh, using the data on Russia, it's, it's not um, such a, uh, a big uh, surprise, perhaps, that Russia is engaging in armed conflicts. This is in the policy brief on this that you can, is available on the website. Okay, so these are the sort of highlights from the first part of the, the democracy report. But then let's go to the second part, and that's sort of the countries that are changing right now, right? Um, regardless of what level they are. So we record the highest number or greatest number of countries autocratizing in the, over the past 50 years. Um, here's how the evidence looks like. So you see the blue line there is the number of countries democratizing. Um, and uh, uh, you see that enormous expansion. I mean, uh, in the mid, late, uh, mid to late 1990s, 72 countries at the same time advancing on democracy. And then that just sloped, slumped down to 15 last year with slightly more than 3% of the world population. And meanwhile, we've had over 20 years now, started with Russia under Putin and Chavez in Venezuela, uh, of number of countries autocratizing and going up and now steeply in the last couple of years, up to 33 uh, in our last count. Uh, that's another sign for us that a lot of actors are becoming more emboldened uh, and, and taking more decisive action uh, down this path. This is really worrying because this is from a scientific publication where we looked at all episodes of autocratization that started in democracies. And no matter how we slice this data, right, about 80% of them die, breakdown. So just a statistical probability here. 
um, that countries now autocratizing with state democracies is very low. And this, uh, just to give you an idea of the changing sort of nature in that sense, like autocratization had already started 10 years ago in the world as we just saw, but then here's a graph showing different components of democracy, indices for those, comparing 2011 with 10 years before that. And if you're above the line, then the indicator, um, that index has improved statistically significantly in more countries than they declined, right? So all aspects of, 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 of uh, democracy here improved still in more countries than they declined. And then look at this visual. 10 years later, boom, right? Everything is now below the line. Right? Uh, and worst of all, freedom of expression, and then this deliberation, which is sort of the quality of debate, respect for, respect for counter-arguments, and that sort of thing. Which are the worst offenders? Well, here's the list, the top 10, the, the ones that have declined the most on the liberal democracy index in the last 10 years. Um, and note, not only do we have these uh, big important countries, India, Brazil, uh, Turkey, and so on, on this list, but they were all democracies 10 years ago, right? either electoral or liberal democracies, but they were democracies. Seven out of 10 are today non-democracies, autocracies of one or the other kind. Um, so also in this contemporary period, just the last 10 years, seems to sort of follow that historical pattern <coughs> that we found in that scientific publication. Um, and if we zoom in and look at the last three years here, then there are a, a number of new countries that don't show up in the longer time series. So countries that have recently started to autocratize. Um, Slovenia, Tunisia with a, with a self-coup or autogolpe, Ivory Coast, Myanmar with a coup, Afghanistan with Taliban. Um, so, and again, uh, uh, seven out of the ten are now uh, autocracies. Although here, in the short perspective, the Taliban uh, or Afghanistan and Myanmar obviously were not democracies uh, three years ago either. Um, so this is worrying. And the Slovenia there made us look in particular at the EU. And now we see that, you know, 20% of the EU members are in an episode of autocratization. To varying degrees. Have we know Hungary and Poland has been going on for a long while. Hungary is no longer a democracy. Poland still is right on that sort of threshold. Uh, but Slovenia in the last few years, a significant downsliding or backsliding. And then to a much lesser degree, but still statistically significant, Croatia, Czech, Czech Republic and Greece. And then the neighbors um, where it's been going on for a while and none of them are democracies. So when we look at the, the, the changes in the world, they are really worrying and sort of pointing to that there's something new, more, what should I say, but the actors have been emboldened. But there are some additional signs of this that I just wanted to, that we discuss in the third part of the report, I wanted to just highlight. The first one is coups. So in 2021, uh, the U.S. Secretary General called it an epidemic. Uh, there were six coups, five military coups, and then the self-coup in Tunisia. Uh, and this is, to us, sort of another sign of the, that the actors care less about the international community and these norms about democracy, elections, and all that. They fear sort of retribution less. There were also a few attempted coups that failed uh, in addition to this. Another sign is that polarization is now spreading. You know all about that in, in the United States, but the, it's spreading to toxic levels in, now we record 40 countries, and toxic levels when the different camps start to feel that the other camp is threatening our nation, threatening our way of life, have you heard that in the US? Um, uh, threatening sort of our future and who we are. And in extension of that, 
you can use that to start suppressing civil liberties, their ex freedom of expression, and in the sort of extreme version of that, of course, is uh, legitimizing political violence. So this is really worrying. Uh, and here's a, just a visual for you. Above the line, polarization has gotten statistically significant and substantially uh, worse uh, in, in the last 10 years. And you see all these countries there. And then if you're in the sort of upper third here, you're reaching really toxic levels uh, that are dangerous for undermining democracy. Um, and it has a close co correlation with uh, 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 with autocratization. So here are just five of the top autocratizers as examples. This is not cherry picking. This is a very general pattern across all the countries that ha see this with um, increasing and toxic levels of polarization. You have three indicators here of polarization. They go up and shortly after liberal democracy goes down. That's just another indication that the political leaders, the autocrats and wannabe autocrats are using polarization, feeding it and instrumentalizing it to be able to dismantle and derail democracy. <clears throat> this is, of course, closely uh, entangled with the spread of misinformation and disinformation, if you like. Um, we see both autocratic governments, but also wannabe autocratic governments, uh, you increasing their use of misinformation across the board. Uh, here's just one indicator uh, where government spread of misinformation in the domestic arena. And again, with the world average there in, in the middle, and then the different regions, and you can see these steep curves upward and reaching really high levels, except in Western Europe and North America, of course. If I put US here, it will be at the high level, um, as you know. Um, but on average, Western Europe and North America is, is, is less. But it's reaching really high levels. And <clears throat> this goes hand in hand with um, strategies for increasing polarization, becomes this vicious circle um, that is, is part of the autocratization trend. So that's really the, the sort of the highlights from the third part of the report um, that are further indications of what we think is a changing nature of autocratization. Um, it's all in the report. The report uh, is freely available from the website. Uh, here's our new website, the new design. We're very happy, so please say it's nice. Um, and um, uh, on the website, you also have these graphing tools, if you don't want to download the data set, which now has some 30 million data on democracy and human rights and so on, um, and play around with, with state and R, if you don't like that sort of stuff, then you can use these online tools to access the data, graph your country or your region, um, and, uh, and download whatever graphs uh, you make and use them freely. It's all available. Uh, there. And on that note, let me say thank you for listening. I look forward uh, to the rest of the conversation here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, before I'm going to turn it over to Cassie in a second, but I wanted to ask you one question before we, um, we transfer over to talk about how, you know, we're trying to use this data and when we're looking at our, the countries in which we're working in. But a question that I have for you is, you know, that, that chart that shows that the wave of democracy that took place after, you know, in the early 90s, that it's mostly been gone, um, or it's mostly gone. Do you, do you think that's a floor or do you think, or do you think it might continue down further? Um, it, can, it can continue further, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. so I think, you know, it's, it's just more reason for uh, the world to pay attention, I think. Um, it, that's a depressing thought, but true. Um, and I do think, um, I wonder, what do you think uh, this, the situation in Ukraine and, and the way that Ukraine has performed in this environment, do you think that would have any effect on what we're seeing globally? Uh, I know it's a discussion that's happening in this town, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Well, the, the silver lining on what's going on right now is that, well, one, uh, 
Ukraine seems to be winning much of the war, at least in this perspective, which nobody expected, and, and it's really great. Um, uh, but but the, the other s sort of silver lining is that it, it made, I think, Europe to sit up. Right. The EU even got to, they even managed to kick Orban into line uh, and, and stand up for democracy in some way. Although his government machinery on the media all immediately started to put out pro-Russian messaging immediately after that, that it's all NATO's fault in reality, it, you know, Russia was forced to do this and all that. So, so that's still going on in Hungary, but at least at the official level, with the EU, um, yeah, even Hungary has f f fallen into line and, and, and support. But the, so it's galvanized and made uh, and, and made politicians to sit up, and maybe also sort of the the, the 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 bureaucrats to sit up and realize, okay, it's it's this threat to democracy in the world is real, right? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I I hope that it helps. I hope we can use. Yeah. yeah, I hope that it, it, the collective action problem of doing something about it, I hope this helps bring some of that um, really to point. So, well, thank you very much. I'm sure you'll have more questions um, at the end. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to um, Fernanda, I believe, um, to discuss uh, some of the her presentation. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, Chad, and thank you, Stefan, for this great overview. Uh, let me say the website is very cool. So, <laughs> um, all right. So the the uh, overall uh, picture that Stefan just provided to us is not great, right? But there are also some opportunities there for learning. Uh, so before we get into the countries that are democratizing, they're going against this current wave. Uh, I think one of the questions that we might, must ask is why do we care, right? Why do we care about democracy? Why do we care about promoting democracy? And I think the answer is actually very simple. Democracy is still a very good deal, right? Uh, the case for democracy project that we then um, uh, is doing and Stefan just briefly mentioned uh, provides a lot of scientific evidence that it's still the best uh, uh, form of government in providing public goods such as uh, access to water and electricity and internet uh, democracies tend to have higher GDP per capita. Also, they are less vulnerable to financial crisis. Uh, countries transitioning to democracy tend to have a higher life expectancy, uh, three years, uh, if I remember correctly, and also a lower uh, infant mortality rate, up to 94%. Uh, they are also more effective at dealing with emerging challenges such as climate change. So countries are more willing to make you know, ambitious uh, climate policies and to uh, act on them. And uh, as Stefan also mentioned, there is new evidence supporting the, the democratic peace theory, which is a, a relief, uh, even though, uh, well, you know, we, we're seeing what we're seeing in, in uh, Eastern Europe right now, those countries that do, do not reach a certain level of democracy, they're still very vulnerable to those uh, disastrous uh, wars. So getting to the democratization trends, right? Uh, we talked to some of the, the program teams at IFAS to understand what they mean, what those democratic gains mean in, in, in practice, what was done to achieve those trends that uh, Stefan was just mentioning. Uh, we have a list here of the 10, uh, top 10 democratizers, so the, the countries that uh, uh, democratized in that 10 year period, but this list is also complicated and we'll talk a little bit more about that later but just getting into some details here of some of these countries and what they did. So Armenia, for example, uh, as we can see here, uh, and something that I should mention too is that Redem's report found that uh, the, the, the higher average gains in democracy uh, around the world, except for Latin America and uh, Middle East and North Africa were in the elections uh, area, right? So. Uh, we checked with our teams to see how that translated into, into practice. Uh, in Armenia, as you can see here, and this was this graph was created using VDEM's graphing tool, uh, some increases in EMB autonomy and EMB capacity, right? And what we saw in the field, uh, talking to your program teams, is that indeed uh, between 2020 and 2021, uh, they passed very important electoral reforms that uh, uh, leveled the, the playing field. Uh, with especially political party law changes that made uh, the, the election more competitive, uh, more accessible to political parties uh, from the, the, the whole political spectrum. 
uh, they strict uh, they they implemented more strict uh, financial spending rules, which also uh, can decrease uh, the opportunities for corruption and abuse of state resources. Uh, they had uh, more inclusive consultation processes, so understanding what the stakeholders uh, wanted and uh, ensuring more consensus in those reforms. And they also created financial incentives for political parties meeting the 40% gender quota, so also increasing the inclusivity of the process. Uh, Malawi also had uh, some uh, gains here in terms of electoral uh, uh, processes. EMB autonomy increasing. We also saw an increase in EMB capacity that uh, just had a slight decrease in the past couple of years. Uh, after the 2019 election, we saw uh, active participation of civil society demanding uh, new elections. Um, they improved electoral forms. So I don't know uh, if you guys are aware, but in 2019 with the elections there, there were a lot of problems in the, the filling out of uh, forms at the polling stations. The elections were known as the TIPEX elections or the whiteout elections because the, the poll workers were fixing issues in the forms. Of course, that led to uh, some mistrust in the process. So they fixed that, they optimized results management processes, they increased the transparency in the results management, uh, overall increasing the, the trust in the process. Sorry. Yeah, uh, and why I mentioned in the beginning that uh, that list was complicated, right? So Georgia and Tunisia were top democratizers in that uh, uh, time period. But now we are also seeing uh, a new uh, decrease in some indicators for Georgia, also driven by increased political polarization uh, that's leading also to perceived politicization of public institutions. So that's probably why we're seeing a, a decrease there in uh, AMB autonomy. And Tunisia, as Stefan was mentioning, right, Tunisia was a top democratizer uh, in that 10 year period. And in 2021, we saw the self coup that led to President Sayed uh, uh, governing by presidential decree. So Tunisia turned, went from a top democratizer to a top autocratizer in that time period. So just uh, very brief conclusions here. Uh, what we can see is that democratic progress amid this global wave of autocratization is still possible, right? Even though a lot of countries are autocratizing, uh, we are seeing like a global uh, erosion of democracy. Some countries are showing that it's still possible to go against this current and to uh, uh, enact democratic gains. Um, good elections require efforts on different fronts. Uh, it's not just on the, the election, electoral management body side, it's also in civil society, it's on political parties, uh, but almost invariably, for us to have good elections, we need independent electoral authorities, uh, trusted public institutions, we need a level playing field in which political parties can uh, be competitive and they have actual uh, opportunity to, to gain power. And uh, it must be an inclusive uh, and participatory, participatory process, right? Consultation and ensuring that stakeholders can uh, uh, voice their demands, voice their interests, and there is some kind of consensus on what's best for the, their democracy. Uh, and finally, uh, one thing that unfortunately is very true, as we can see in this trend, that democratic gains can be fragile, right? A top democratizer can turn into a top autocratizer in a matter of a few years. So our work here is never really done. Uh, democracy is always in uh, a work in progress. So that's why it's so important that we keep uh, looking at those trends. We keep understanding the, the precursors of uh, democratic backsliding and working to prevent that from uh, uh, really breaking and collapsing uh, the whole structure. So I'll end here for now and uh, happy to hear your thoughts and questions later. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Fernanda. Um, a quick question before we turn to Cassie. Um, when you've talked to the, our field offices, um, you know, we, we've got field offices in Tunisia where we've seen a turn. We've got um, field offices in Armenia. Um, do you get a sense? Um, how do you think they are feeling in regards to the trend of things? I know that we go up and down in regards to the level of democracy and it's a continual fight. But um, I know uh, the new turn to democracy in Armenia, for example, was, was met with such um, optimism. 
you know, what do you get a sense from them now as to where things are going? Do you, do they get us, does our field staff feel like it's going to be sustainable or did you not get that, um, get into that detail with them? Uh, partially. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a great question. And, uh, it, it's hard sometimes, right. To look at the big picture when we are having those, uh, direct relationships with the stakeholders there. And we, we see their political will, we see that they are interested in, uh, making democratic reforms, and we might be more optimistic about the the future of the the processes there. <laughs> but yeah, like one of the our uh, country directors was mentioning how uh, <clears throat> you know uh, although there is a lot of optimism about uh, Armenia, for example, there is always that fear, right, with uh, Russia right in there. Uh, the, the, their door there, uh, and uh, some other factors that are way uh, outside the control of uh, the, those democratic champions, right? So it's not just about the electoral authorities, but also, you know, the political leaders, uh, the people who are engaging with, uh, with Russia, the people who are uh, afraid of Russia, um, and uh, yeah, so Armenia, the, they had the, the, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, uh, mm -hmm. war also that completely changed the way they were seeing the security issues in the country. So it's not just about political will, although political will is a huge part of it, right? There are so many other factors that are outside our, our control. So I think that it, there's always a cautious, cautious optimism there. We are seeing that, that uh, interest, they're, uh, you know, they're all eager to, to advance democracy, but Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, things happen and there are other factors there that uh, prevent that from happening. But yeah, so I think that's how we would summarize that the feeling. It's a, a general cautious optimism. Great, thank you. And I have to say, um, you definitely get an IFAS um, gold star for discussing reducing errors in election forms and building trust in elections. That's a very obvious response to something. <laughs> um, but I, a, a quick, very quick question on that front. Um, you know, so many times I think that we're looking for, and you've looked at election administration uh, extensively in many ways, both in regards to the um, COVID crisis, but also, you know, you've done a lot of work in regards to IFAS's work over 20 years and, and SEPs so that our partners, NDI, IRI's work over 20 years. Um, in transitional countries. You know, so many times I think we're looking at technology as a way to fix things. Um, there's gonna be some, some technology that comes along that's gonna answer all of, our, all of our problems. If we could just invest in this one thing that that's gonna fix it. Um, in your experience, you know, I, is it sometimes, uh, I guess I'm leading the, I'm, I'm leading the witness here. Um, sometimes it's reducing errors in forms. Um, when you look at some of these election administrative issues, you know, how do you put that in context with this constant narrative of trying to have technology fix our problems? That's a great question. And I'm not sure I, I am the best person to answer it, but yeah, yeah. In the project that we analyzed that you, you were mentioning. So we analyzed the, uh, some transitions in uh, 18 different countries in the past uh, 25 years and uh, what really led to more sustainable results, right? And one thing that we, we found was that a lot of those countries, a lot of the, the, the partners who wanted more technology, they wanted technology for voter registration. Sometimes it was for, for voting, right? Thinking that uh, it could really improve trust in the process. But trust is really much more subjective and complicated than uh, we usually think. Uh, we have, uh, sometimes we are wary of new technology because they, it really needs to be tested and needs to be uh, some kind of real, like a voter information, voter education process to uh, make everybody understand uh, the, the process and to trust the technology. Uh, so it takes a lot of time for it to be implemented in a, in a responsible way. Sometimes it's costly, so local uh, partners might not be able to pay for you know, simple things like licenses or uh, the maintenance of the, that equipment. So it might not be sustainable. It might not be the best solution. Uh, uh, in one of the, the countries that we worked in, uh, they thought that voter registration would be the way, uh, the electronic voter registration would be the way to go to increase enfranchisement. And turns out uh, it was just a matter of making uh, queues separate for men and women because they didn't want to be together. Right, so sometimes the, the, the solution is much simpler than uh, technology. Uh, 
Uh, but still, it, it's uh, it's an opportunity that's out there. It's just a matter of understanding how we can better, uh, how we can be more responsible about implementing it in a way that builds trust instead of creating more layers of unknowns and, and hidden processes that people don't understand. So it's an opportunity, but it can also bring some risks that we just need to be aware of. Great. Thank you. No, I... Um... The ways in which we build trust is something I know we're all looking at closely um, and how we continue to build up um, uh, the ability of democracy to be resistant to some of these changes. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna now turn to Cassie. Great, thank you so much. Um, what I want to pick up on today is one of the conclusions that Stefan highlighted uh, from the VDEM 2020 report. And that's this fact that misinformation is multiplying. And when we look at that fact in combination with one of the briefing papers in the case for democracy um, that specifically focused on data provision, transparency, and quality. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, Nanda. Thanks. Um, so here are the main takeaways from that briefing paper. <clears throat> so the first is that democracies supply more data than autocracies. And on its face, this makes perfect sense, right? Reliable information is a public good. And we've already seen um, from some of the data that Fernanda had just shown us that democracies are better providers of public goods in a number of other issue areas as well. The second trend is that democracy's data is more transparent than the data provided from autocratic governments. This is also in line with expectations since democratic institutions themselves are expected to function transparently. But now when we look at this third element, uh, third, third trend, it's that autocracies are manipulating their data tracking uh, domestic performance indicators. And this is everything from economic performance to public health and even support of the regime. Now, importantly, this manipulation occurs in two ways. So first there can be self-censorship where local officials are misrepresenting reality on the ground when reporting to a central authority or national government out of fear of reprisal. Uh, but at the same time, an autocratic head of state has different incentives to make it appear as though their country is performing better than it truly is on a global stage. So we're in an era of big data, uh, and I don't just say that because that's my job every day, but this is true. We all feel that in our everyday lives. Um, and so these patterns are and are only going to continue to be more and more important. And what is it exactly that we can glean from these three findings? Uh, what these three conclusions make clear to me is that data is not inherently good or bad. It's about its intent and it's about its use. So while high levels of data transparency and data provision, for instance, come with a lot of positive implications and we promote them, um, it also comes with the paired risk of misinformation and even more malign disinformation. So data is this double-edged sword that we need to think about both sides of as we're utilizing it. Um, more particularly, there are two explicit risks to democracy that are kind of implied in these three trends. But fortunately, and I'll, I'll uh, echo Chad's optimism that he started this uh, panel with, there also are risks that we have proven ways of mitigating. So I'll close with those. But first, the risks. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So democracies that transparently report their data do so even when they're performing poorly. And in a functioning democracy, we want to know what's not working, what areas need improvement. We want to debate that uh, and find ways to constantly be improving. However, when democracies are this transparent about where they're falling short, it creates opportunities for direct critiques and challenges not just to those particular parts of the program, but to the entire democratic enterprise. Now, those challenges might come from domestic political opponents, and here is where that vicious cycle uh, between disinformation and polarization that Stefan mentioned in his presentation uh, comes back in. I think of that global rise of polarization here. 
but the challenge can also come from non-democratic foreign actors, primarily foreign governments that are looking for ways to weaken uh, those that they see as competitors. So in this case, the risk is that autocrats are going to exploit democracy's transparency in order to cast doubt over democracy's benefits. The second and closely related risk is that autocrats are contributing to this infodemic um, by creating and disseminating disinformation. And they're doing this domestically as well as across borders. But the potential result here is that they can generate distrust in one's political representatives, as well as overall dissatisfaction with democracy once again. And these efforts have spillover effects into areas that we care about, such as distrust of an election result. Uh, now, VDEM has tracked the use of false information for several years, uh, or what we would call disinformation. So on the next slide, I also used uh, your website to generate a couple of charts that just look at um, the use of disinformation techniques around the world. So as there, we see a, a slight but very noticeable trend downwards in every region of the world and uh, the darkest line in there, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, can't quite see it, is the world as a whole, um, where there's more and more presence of false information, either from one's own government or from foreign governments. So taking all of this, what's the solution? First, in order to counter the effect of autocrats exploiting democracy's transparency, we need to amplify the platforms of those local actors who are supportive of the democratic process and see the value in that transparency. Second, in the case of the infodemic uh, and the need to work you know, faster than the producers of that disinformation, what we can do is contribute to civic education and increase people's ability to identify reliable pieces of information, reliable sources of information, and perhaps even provide uh, trustworthy external sources of that information ourselves. So this might seem like tall orders, abstract, um, but they actually are quite actionable. And here's again where I want to echo the optimism that Chad opened with, because we can highlight just two examples of ways that IFAS has tried to act in these spaces to counter these very trends. So first, we've conducted trainings with local partners, civil society organizations, and activists on digital literacy. These disinformation trainings have covered things such as how to assess information for accuracy, how to detect bias and false information, and how to verify sources, uh, whether they are legitimate through triangulation. Uh, I think back to you know, how I learned to navigate the internet. And these are skills that we can help to uh, disseminate more broadly, especially as the internet is constantly changing. Um, we had a webinar actually as a very specific example, there was a webinar conducted last April um, so a year ago now in Ukraine on exactly this issue that gave participants the means of protecting themselves from manipulation on the internet. Uh, and similar trainings have reached over 300 people uh, in the Asia Pacific region. But a second example, in addition to helping people mitigate their risk of exposure to, uh, to this disinformation, we also have a few resources that we've tried to provide that can be reliable external sources of information for people. So we have Election Guide that publishes reliable election results, um, things that are helpful both before and after the election, such as when your voting registration date is, what the turnout was, and so much more. Uh, we also have Countering it Disinformation Guide, which pools resources and examples of citizens' initiatives and civil society efforts to promote information integrity. So in some data provision and transparency are public goods, democracies deliver on them for better or for worse. But what's important to understand uh, is that the risks around disinformation provision and the infodemic should, um, are, are things we should be very attentive to and be able to identify and help other people be able to identify. And if we're aware of these efforts, 
we can be reassured that there are many ways to counter them. It's just putting a name to the face and then matching our efforts uh, to those countermeasures. And with that, I will end and leave some time for uh, questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm not often accused of being an optimist, but I'll, I'll take that today. <laughs> um, you know, a question that I have for you uh, in the use of data, um, and I and I, you know, it'd be interesting to hear from all of you. Um, you know, in the it, you you've talked about how autocrats manipulate the data that they're using. Um, are you seeing in your research or in your discussions? I know you're you're rather new to IFAS, but you're talking to our field staff and others. Are there ways for us, as I suggested earlier, for us to change the narrative? I like the term that Fernanda used, um, democracy is a good deal. I think she could maybe um, copyright that. Um, I, how do we get that narrative out, not just IFAS, but the democracy community? And is there data that, and, and it's also, um, you know, Stefan's work is showing that data does deliver. Is there ways for us to use data to illustrate that in a more effective way, do you think? Yeah, I mean, my recommendation in this is, is usually the same, which is we can't get too tied to thinking about this as quantitative indicators, but thinking about qualitative, anecdotal, narrative pieces of information that can work in tandem with the, that data. So in an era of big data, the focus of a lot of autocrats is on fudging the numbers. Um, but you can't do that to a narrative. <laughs> the narrative is still what it is. So this is why it's so important to bring different types of information around one topic or one problem, what, what have you, together to get a full comprehensive view um, of what's right. actually happening. All right, and Stefan, a question, on, a question for you on that front. Um, you know, I think so much of when disinformation and misinformation became such a huge issue you know it's been around for a long time but i think 2016 you know get made everybody just you know completely aware of it a lot of the um and this could go to all the panelists all of you know so many people pursued a policy of trying to chase down and disprove all of the lies <laughs> that are being you know that are that are crowding the field um have, have you looked at that, Steph? I don't know if you if you have looked at that at all, or that this idea of trying to fact check and trying to have this, you know, trying to fight this negative narrative, is that the way to go? Or have you looked at that in any way in comparison to trying to just set out a different narrative that shows the democracy works and not chasing down every single lie that comes out because in the end that consumes all of your time i don't know if you guys have thought about that or looked at that Stefan. yeah um let me say this democracy dies with the lies mm -hmm. democracy is founded on accountability vertical accountability from voters and their elected representatives and then this horizontal accountability uh, with other institutions checking the executive. Now, if you can get away with 20,000 lies and not be held accountable and say, I didn't say that, I didn't do that, what I did was this, and I provided this, and people believe it, then there is no relationship but between what you do in office and what you're voted in or out for. Um, and. And then we can, I mean, we can stop hold elections. It doesn't matter anymore. Right. There is no democracy in that environment that's full of lies, conspiracy theories, and, and what is it, alternative facts and whatever. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so, so it is a really serious challenge. And, and, and I would say, I think the big challenge, even if we survive this current wave and the invasion of Ukraine and all that, we're still going to be facing the big challenge of how to limit freedom of uh, speech in order to save it. Right? The parallel was after World War II, we had the, the, what countries then were facing was how to limit freedom of association in order to save it, to prevent Nazi and fascist organizations and then parties and come over and take over democracy and do away with it. Now we have the same challenge. I don't have the solution. I think 
in the short term, yeah, the narrative issue I think is really important, right? I mean, it, it, you can you can try all the numbers and you can tell in 10 years or 20 years time, infant mortalities can be lower. Well, that's not going to yeah some statistics but you can tell people well if if you want to be like china then also be prepared that the the government security agency can walk into your bedroom and pick up your son and throw him in or daughter and throw them into jail and torture them and you can't do nothing right do you want that i mean there that maybe that sort of narratives uh because there are some intrinsic uh, uh rights and freedoms that people really cherish, uh, at least when they lose them, they, they start to... Right. Unfortunately, it's when they lose them, when they realize how much they cherish them, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cassie, any, any thoughts from you on this? No, I mean, I think that echoes um, perhaps more eloquently what I was just getting at too, um, that it's bringing those examples to the fore um, in places where they're easily dismissed. Right. And then, so one uh, question that we, oh, go ahead. Also, I think an organization like you guys, you're doing so much important work and have been doing so much important work. And you know, I started out as a scholar studying elections. So I love you guys. <laughs> and I will credit uh, Julia Leininger for this from, from the German Development Institute, because she, she really, uh, 2019 sort of put this one, in one of our panels with Larry Diamond and Sarah Lister from UNEP, and said, we have to stop thinking in terms of democracy promotion and support. We have to think in terms of democracy protection. Uh, and that's a different ball game, right? So think of for you guys, support instead of supporting institutional reform and creating an electoral management body that's autonomous and train these people to do better qualitative elections and all that, you have to train them to protect themselves from the executive. That's a different program, right? <laughs> so we have to shift our minds to that we can't be doing the same thing that we started doing in the 90s, have developed upon until now. We have to Think of it in terms of programs and interventions that will protect these institutions and people from autocratization. Yeah, I think that um, is such an important point in how we pivot to that. Um, and it, it really changes. I also think from that point of view, it also changes, you know, there's, there's a sense that an election has to be perfect for it to, to equate to the will of the people. But as we all know, it's a huge affair. Their mistakes will be made. There's no perfect election. So how do you protect the trust and the results, I think is a very different animal than trying to produce a perfect election. Um, and it allows you to look at the whole process differently. I think it's hugely important. I saw during uh, that point that you were making, Fernando was, shaking her head. I wonder, Fernando, what are your thoughts when you looked at these, you know, minute uh, administrative issues um, from that kind of change in perspective? Yeah, I was not in exactly because actually, uh, you know, some of, two of the countries in that list of top democratizers are in Latin America, Ecuador and the Dominican Republic. And some of my colleagues asked like, why we're not talking about the electoral improvements there, right? But that was one of the findings of VDEM, like the, the, the main democratic gains in, in Latin America, at least in those two countries, was in terms of uh, judicial constraints on the executive. And that's so important, like for those two countries that that happened when in Brazil, we are seeing the exact opposite, right? And uh, the Brazil is a top autocratizer now. We are seeing that in El Salvador as well. So countries that are trying to co-opt uh, the, the institutions they are there to provide checks and balances, right? So yeah, I, I very much agree with you, Stefan, uh, in the sense that uh, when we are promoting democracy or supporting democracy, we, are, we cannot just focus on you know, the processes of the, the ballot casting and stuff like that. We really have to take a holistic approach that understands what the, the threats are uh, from all fronts, right? To electoral officials, to civil society, to the media, uh, and uh, and try to to work with uh, our our partners, our democracy champions in those countries to try to to address those from uh, uh, all the different where they are coming. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's you know the the problems are getting more and more complex. So our solutions have to uh, become more and more complex as well. 
Great, thank you. Um, I've been asking all the questions. Uh, sorry, I'm just too interested in this. Um, so I, we we're just about out of time. I think we, is there anybody who has a, I know we've got some, uh, some questions in the Q&A. Is there anybody online uh, who would like to ask a question? No. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, Chad, I there yes. is somebody there. Yes. Uh, okay. Farida? Great. Yes. Great. Uh, Please go is, ahead. Yeah. This is Farida from uh, Uganda. I, I I actually concur with the, the the speaker who says that we need to protect the institutions. But I want to share with participants one of the scenarios in Uganda that has just happened. One uh, when we had elections, uh, voters went out to vote, and that was a by election. Uh, the voters went out to vote and they voted in, in large numbers and they voted the opposition. Oh, I think we've lost. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I think we've lost. Uh, I think we've lost her. Um... When the results came, when the results came in, uh, they were totally different. But uh, the person, when the returning officer was reading, she was reading the exact results, but when they printed results, they're different and they were in support of the, 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 the candidate that the executive was supporting. So we need to go an extra mile to ensure that results, we check, we, we, how do we protect the results up to the end? Because you, don't, you cannot actually uh, observe uh, the, how they are transmitting results in the tari, in the tari system. Um, yes, thank you for that question. It's interesting before we had a discussion a little bit before we got on the panel and I was um, saying that it, we absolutely need to have um, results tabulated at the local level at the precinct level, so that you can see um, how those results are being transferred to the final count. It's a huge transparency and trust building exercise and we were hoping we we at IFAS, we'd like to be able to collect that data so we could know which countries do that and, and to help us see about how that correlates to trust in election. It'd be a great, great thing to do um, and something we've discussed. Um, we're, we're at time. Um, and so I just want to thank the panelists and, and Stefan, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, it's, it's hugely important and you know that our community um, uses the data um, a great deal. I think IFAS, we're trying very hard to bridge the gap between the academic work and having that influence our work on the ground. Um, and I know that the staff at IFAS very much appreciate the work you do and how we're trying to make those connections. I do hope that um, if there's something positive that comes out of the Ukraine situation is that liberal democracies start to address the collective action problem that we've had when it comes to kleptocracy and, and, and corruption and other issues. Um, I also um, think it's something we need to really think about. Uh, the question that I led with uh, Fernando was, we have to remember that we are protecting the elections and it's not always gonna be technology that corrects that. I think some of our old traditional ways like releasing results at the precinct level can have a lot of trust. And if the results transmission system is all um, technical and elect and it's a black box people won't trust it we have to remember these things um, and then also with Cassie I think the idea of how we use data to our benefit we know that autocracies and surveillance countries are using data for their own purposes I think the West and liberal democracies need to start to think about how we use data and the narrative we can tell um, for our advantage too and I think all of those issues were highlighted today so um, and then lastly, I want to, again, echo Fernandez. I think I, we're going to copyright it. Democracy is a good deal. I think we've got to try to sell that a little bit better um, because I think it's true. But thank you all very much. And um, uh, I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion uh, as we meet in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.